morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the Department of Public Utilities virtual open house regarding the rehabilitation of one of our city's most important drinking water wells, our Fourth Avenue well. I'm Laura Briefer. I'm the director of the Salt Lake City Department of Public Utilities. Our agency is responsible for providing drinking water to residents across Salt Lake City and the eastern portion of Salt Lake County. We also provide sanitary sewer, stormwater, and street lighting services throughout Salt Lake City. I appreciate very much all of those who can join us today to learn about this important project and provide feedback in, the in this challenging time and in this open house format that is different than what we're typically used to. We appreciate your patience with us as this is the first time we have presented in this format, but we're really glad that you can make it and join us. Um, we invite input via the Facebook feed um, throughout the presentation, we'll be documenting that, and then we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. In addition to myself, we have uh, our whole team here. We've got our Deputy Director, Jesse Stewart, who will be moderating from part of the presentation. We have our architects from CRSA Architects, and that is John Uanowski and Zach Craig. So you'll also be hearing from them for part of the presentation. Um, we've got engineering staff here and available to answer questions. Um, and we also have our public engagement team here listening and talking to the um, I'm now going to share my PowerPoint presentation. And again, thank you very much for joining us. Um, just going through the meeting agenda here, uh, we already took care of some introductions. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the goal of this meeting. Um, Jesse Stewart, our deputy director, will talk about the project overview. And then our architects will discuss the design parameters and renderings. And we'll give you a sense of what's next on this project and answer any questions in real time. So the goal for this meeting, uh, really we want your input and feedback on the architectural design options of building that is going to house this rehabilitated well. Um, this well is in a location that is one of the most storied locations in the city. It is near the mouth of Memory Grove Canyon at Fourth Avenue and Canyon Road. And it's in a historic district and has to meet certain historic um, regulatory we want this building to fit in with the community and we want it to be functional for the operation of this drinking water well. We've heard a lot over the last two years from the general public at previous public meetings and hearings about what they would like to see in this location. And we spent quite a bit of time facilitating working group meetings with residents who live near the site to obtain their suggestions. Based on all of this, input, our architects have developed some architectural design options that we are excited to share with you. Um, this project has some complexity to it. In addition to meeting historic district zoning regulations, um, we also need to make sure that it complies with the regulatory requirements that are on us with respect to providing safe drinking water without meeting all of the requirements for this infrastructure that have has to be State Division of Drinking Water and meeting Safe Drinking Water Act requirements. Uh, we also have a number of city codes we need to meet as well. And at this time, I will turn it over to Deputy Director Jesse Stewart to talk about the project overview um, to give a little bit more. Thank you. Good morning, Laura. Uh, thanks, Laura. Good morning. This is Jesse Stewart, uh, Deputy Director here. I'm going to share my screen here in a second and talk about the project overview, and then I'll be turning the slideshow over to John Uanowski and Zach Clegg from CRSA to talk about uh, the building design. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen here, and we'll see if this all works in the new world we're living in. So hopefully everybody's got that. Uh, as Laura mentioned, uh, this is a, a very critical well for us in Salt Lake City. It uh, pr can provide 100% of the water for downtown during peak demand and is also essential for firefighting. Uh, the water from this well can go all the way out um, over to Beck Street and beyond. It's serving about 12,000 connections, uh, including much of, down, much, much of downtown. 
Uh, the well, as it currently sits, you can see the, the photo we've got there. That's the well as it currently sits in the, the little um, island park at 4th Avenue. Well, we've got some electrical components above ground, and then that kind of brownish uh, box with the handles on it. That's the vault lid that goes into a subsurface vault where the well head and a lot more of the electrical components are located. Uh, the need to upgrade this well is pretty important to us here at Public Utilities. Uh, we need to upgrade it to meet current safety and envir environmental requirements. Uh, we need to bring the wellhead above ground, the electrical above ground, and uh, make it a safe environment for ourselves so we can continue to provide up to 7 million gallons of water a day to Salt Lake City. Uh, right now, the well is at risk of failure, it's unsafe for our workers, and it doesn't comply with drinking water codes or electrical codes, as Laura mentioned. Uh, the core elements of this project, um, again, we've been working on this for a couple of years with the stakeholders and the community, and I just want to go over some of the core elements in case there's anybody new to the call. Um, really, what we're going to do is we're going to reline the well as it goes, so it'll be some work on the actual hole in the ground itself. It's a 20-inch hole, about 470 feet deep. Uh, we're going to put a smaller casing in that and give that well um, go from a 20-year life expectancy of the existing casing to up to 100 years. So we're going to really improve the life of this well. Uh, we're also going to put a new wellhead and electrical system, both above ground in a small secure building. Uh, we'll also have a new pump and motor and an on-site disinfection system. So those are really the core elements. Again, relining it above ground, uh, wellhead and electrical components, and a new pump and motor along with disinfection. Uh, as I mentioned, this has been a, a couple of years of working with the community, and in doing so, we've really um, worked with them to, to try to meet their needs while still meeting our needs of being able to provide abundant, um, safe drinking water to our residents. Uh, we've gone from a site plan of about 2,300 square feet. That included a fence. It included a on-site generator and a, a flor fluoridation room. So we've gone from that down to a five to 600 square foot building with no fence. The building itself will provide the security. So it'll be 500 to 600 square feet, about 14 feet tall. And that's what John Yunowski and Jack, Zach Clegg from CRSA will be discussing. Um, some of the things we've done to reduce the size, um, one of the biggest ones was we will not have an on-site portable diesel generator on site. So that's a big, a big, um, site plan savings but it comes at a cost for operations we'll still purchase the generator but it'll be trailer mounted and we'll haul that in periodically to test switch gear and to make sure that it's it's available in an emergency so but it will not be stored on site that'll be stored back at our yard and hauled in when we need it uh, we also worked with the division of drinking water and Lake county health to uh, look at fluoridation requirements for this well and we've determined at this point that we're not going to fluoride fluoridate the well water as we do with a lot of our wells and is mandated, but we feel we can we can get by without that at this point. Um, we've also gone from a liquid um, sodium hypochlorite disinfection system to a tablet calcium hypochlorite disinfection system, which reduces the size of the footprint also. Um, and then we've also taken the flow meter. Flow meter is very critical for this well. We have to be able to accurately measure the flow going out into our retail customers and to the consumers, but also so that we know uh, the dosage for our calcium hypochlorite tablet disinfection system. So we'll have a subsurface vaulted flow meter out there. Uh, we've been working uh, all of this in terms of noise mitigation also. So we'll, John Ionowski will be talking about noise mitigation as we go forward. And then we've also worked with the urban forester to do um, assessment of the trees out there and to have as minimal impact to the trees as we can. Uh, you may have all noticed several months ago, um, Urban Forestry was out there doing some what they call air knifing. So around one around the large plane tree out there, they actually went out and exposed the tree roots, so we could have a better idea of where the critical roots are, and that would help us cite where we're going to put this uh, subsurface flow meter. So again, most of the most of the infrastructure will be above ground in the in the uh, small building we're building, the five to six hundred square foot building, and then there'll be a vaulted flow meter also. Uh, the wellheads coming above ground and the electrical coming above ground to make it safe for our workers. Um, again, let's, let's see where over here. Yeah, two year. Sorry, I'm kind of going through this as I'm as I'm. We're all learning to do this virtually here. Um, John, I believe you're going to take over at this point, and I will be here for questions if there's any questions that come up.
Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Um, once again, my name is John Iwanowski. I'm an architect with CRSA, and I'm acting as the project manager um, on this project. Let me share my screen. So I wanna start by talking about some of the larger design parameters we're working with um, on this project. As Laura Briefer said, it's a pretty complex um, little project. And so these are some of the things we've been thinking about um, throughout this whole process. Let me move some stuff around on my screen. Um, so yeah, we, we have about a five to 600 square foot building. Um, that's designed to house these well components. Basically, the way that we have designed the envelope is to make it as small as we can um, for what's contained on the inside. Um, it will have to be around 14 feet tall. The limiting factor there is the top of the wellhead. Um, and um, a partial fence is needed to cover um, the external um, electrical box. So it's just a fence basically to screen some unsightly building mounted electrical equipment on the north side. And we'll see that in the renderings, but. Um, some of the other larger design parameters we're working with, um, we obviously have to meet the needs of the project. So, you know, providing a good um, shelter for the well. Um, we have to meet the needs and standards of the owner, which is the division of Public Utilities, Department of Public Utilities. Um, we have to follow city codes and ordinances, including, you know, international, the 2018 International Building Code and other model codes that we use in the city. We have to follow and maintain the guidelines defined by the Historic Landmark Commission. We're in, we're right at the boundary between the Avenues Historic District and the Capitol Hill Historic District. So we're kind of working within both those historic districts. Um, and we've worked pretty hard to take into account public input through open houses um, physically previously, and then this digital open house as well. And we've also had kind of a focus group with some of the, the nearby neighbors and avenues residents. Uh, sound is obviously a, a pretty big issue with the well. Um, and we understand that. If you look at the bottom of this chart on the right, um, overall, it's an 86 decibel well pump. That's what they've um, quoted it at. Um, and then above the 86, you can see at different frequencies. So at like 63 hertz, it'll be 46 decibels. So that's pretty low, um, low sound. And then you know normal like mid frequencies, 500 a thousand hertz. It well, it gets louder and it'll be around um, 80 decibels. So our goal when we've been designing the envelope is to minimize that to 50 decibels at the exterior of the building. That's about um, ambient for the neighborhood. It's less than ambient and um, it meets the codes for noise ordinances. Um, we think we can reduce it even further and try to get to around 30 at the exterior of the building. And I'm gonna show you how we're doing that with certain components. So for instance, this, if you look on the left side of the screen, it's showing the, the wall construction that we're planning uh, for the building. It's a concrete masonry um, backup wall, which is the gray block in the back. Um, and there will be continuous insulation and then an air gap and then a brick veneer. Um, so just showing the transmission loss, the transmission reduction um, that the CMU gives us, and this is just the concrete masonry. Um, for instance, this chart, if you look at the 1000 Hertz frequency, um, the pump's been quoted at 82.5 decibels um, and then Walls have been tested to reduce that by 50. So at that thousand Hertz frequency will be reduced to 32.5 decibels on the exterior side of that concrete masonry. So those are, you know, that's just showing that it's a pretty quiet noise coming out of the building. 32 is, you know, whispering. 
that's about how much noise a whisper makes. Um, and so like windows are obviously a concern. Anytime you penetrate that, you know, that um, envelope, you gotta look at the, the acoustical performance of those elements as well. So this is looking at the basis of design window that we've selected. Um, it's uh, sound transmission, you know, it's it's designed to reduce sound transmission. So at that thousand hertz frequency, it's reducing that 82.5 decibels by 44 to 38.5. So even when there are penetrations and fenestration, we feel like, um, you know, we're designing it to really mitigate the sound. This, these are the doors we're basing the design off of. Um, you know, they also reduce the sound. Uh, sound to a significant amount um, on the exterior. And then acoustical louvers we're designing for the um, for the mechanical system. Uh, you know, we have to still bring outside air into the building to ventilate it and send the air back out. So if you look at this, um, you know, this is kind of the weak point at this at this juncture in the design. We're still sharpening our pencils here with the with the mechanical engineer um, and this is just showing that you know by using these acoustical louvers alone we won't meet our project goal of the 50 decibels so we need to figure out some other strategies and we're working on that with the engineer including um, baffles um, within the ductwork and transfer grills and other um, ways that we can mitigate the sound coming out through um, the mechanical system so I am going to pass this on to my colleague, Zach Clegg, and we'll be around for questions um, at any time, including at the end. Thanks, John. Um, so yeah, again, my name is Zach Clegg and I work with CRSA uh, with the, the architectural design for the building and also um, one thing that I feel that we should throw out there too, I think John and I both have a, a pretty big love and um, appreciation for historic architecture. That's kind of our main focus. So this has been a good project to kind of find um, ways to, you know, bring this modern instrument into kind of a historic context and stuff. So we've definitely been keeping that um, at the forefront of our minds as we as we do this, the design works. So let me open up my the presentation here. Um, so, based on the conversations that we've had with kind of the selected focus um, group of residents that live around the, the site, there's been a lot of feedback that we've gotten. Um, some of it's been a little bit, you know, kind of differing and, and we've had some comments that somewhat contradict and things like that, which is expected, you know, when you have a lot of different people giving um, input, but overall we've got some fantastic feedback. Um, just some of the things that we've we've gotten as kind of the priorities for the design, timeless, simple, unobtrusive, and aesthetically pleasing. Um, that's been a really big kind of component, especially that word timeless. People really want it to be something that is historic referencing, but also something that is going to last uh, for the years to come. People are uh, very drawn to the historic design options. Um, we are kind of a little bit bound with that being in the historic district. Uh, HLC does have some requirements where you're not really necessarily um, encouraged to recreate a historic architectural piece, uh, more kind of bring reference and kind of connections, but making it a product of its time. So uh, we've been keeping that in mind. Uh, design elements should pull from historic pump houses. People have really liked kind of this historic Typology, um, a lot of it can be found in Utah, like the stairs plant up Big Cottonwood Canyon, things like that. So kind of referencing the typology of Pump House, it's a very utilitarian kind of brickwork. The brick has been a big um, component along with stone. So stone is very contextual to the site. With the river rock, um, people are more inclined towards kind of a tumbled old brick uh, versus a, a shiny brick. Um, they want the brick to match the context of the area. So a lot of kind of tans and reds and darker bricks um, are very contextual. Needs to age well. So looking back at the timeless, um, let's see, have 
uh, detailing that are kind of, you know, thoughtful and also accentuate the building. Um, they want design that reduces size, but not at the expense of aesthetics. So we definitely have really kind of tried to look at creative ways to minimize the, the mass of the building um, while keeping our clearances and meeting the needs of the project. So that's been a very uh, pertinent issue for us. Uh, like pitch flat, stepped or tapered roof, a design that makes it look small. So the roof line that's been kind of discussion, you know, some people like the flat roof, some people like to pitch. So kind of trying to mitigate that um, people that it pretty consensually, they did not want it to look residential or like a house. They wanted it to read as something that is, you know, utilitarian, but not residential. Um, bringing in again, more historic elements. Uh, there's a lot of support to include windows and fenestration that um, are conscious towards the sound. So not necessarily disregard that opportunity, but um, kind of looking at ways that make sure that it's not a, a setback for us. Um, one big comment was people really like the idea of kind of bringing it as a hybrid to both the residential area that it immediately sits in, but also referencing the park um, just north of it as the park that it's situated in currently is kind of a continuation and kind of an entrance way to memory grow. So, trying to kind of hybrid all the contextual areas around it. Um, one idea that we were kind of working with was the stone, bringing back that river stone. So that was the site that we're currently working at. It was historically, that was Brigham Young's property and he used a lot of um, river rock that they just pulled right from the earth and used that for walls and things like that. And you can see, um, as if you're familiar with the area, it's definitely a strong use there. So. Um, all of these things, um, you know, we've definitely tried to incorporate as much as possible. We have had some, you know, there's, it's a little tricky when there's kind of people pull or ideas that pull a different way, but that's definitely. First here, so here's some, these were kind of the three images that um, people really liked for kind of precedence to a pump house that kind of looks historic with the brickwork and everything like that. So. These are some stock images that residents submitted to us um, as ideas for to bring inspiration. So, you know, a lot of detailing in the brickwork, kind of these tall linear windows. Um, the tan seemed to be a preference here, uh, things like that. So let me get into the first kind of round that we did. So these are um, some options that we presented a couple of weeks ago to our uh, our focus group. These were trying to kind of encapsulate as many of those um, ideas that were listed earlier. So this 1A, 1B, this was kind of looking at a shed roof. Side, but has plenty of historic reference. Uh, the second one was uh, looking at a tan brick with some contextual detailing. So we've had, you know, some ideas. There's some full brickwork within the area that we um, wanted to incorporate. And then the third kind of options over here was looking at red brick and again, just playing that out. So as we showed these to the residents, um, the preferred option that we gathered was uh, option, what we call 3A, was kind of this red brick. Um, they weren't necessarily tied to the brick color, but the form of this, they, they really liked the detailing in there. Um, it's a good balance between the modern and the historic. So we took this idea and we um, came up with a couple kind of more refinements that brought in different color brick coloring and kind of took into account the feedback that we received from the public. So um, from there, we came up with five different uh, further options. So this first one right here was a dark brown brick, which is pretty contextual. Down here is more of a red brick. Um, this one here in the middle and down here, uh, some people commented that they really liked the brick lay uh, seen at Ottinger Hall, which is just at the entrance of the, the park. It's kind of a, a mixed brick with different shades and tones. And then up here we have um, a lighter brick, kind of a tan, which is very typical to a lot of the precedents that we've seen. So um, from there, we kind of narrowed down on what um, our consultants and based on the feedback, which we, the direction that we prefer to go into based on the design. and so. Um, this is the, the option that we came up with here. 
Um, you can see we have a couple different renderings to really give you a perspective of what this building would look like. Um, putting it in the scene, you know, it's surrounded by these huge trees and kind of set apart from the, the buildings around it. So it really, um, although it is 14 feet tall, it kind of has a, a really a scale factor that seems appropriate for the area. Um, let me go to this next one. Yeah, we really looked at it from all four sides as, you know, people live 360 around that. So we wanted people to, you know, make sure that they're not getting, you know, a, a bad view of the building. And so looking really kind of the main thing and the main idea, um, again, like I said earlier, we're really playing on this kind of fine line between not trying to get too historic and can make it look like something that might confuse people in kind of the timeline of the, the built environment of the area. So um, brick is very contextual, but we, we really kind of went with this idea of how can we take brick and by the way we lay it, kind of form it, you know, the, the patterning of it, how can we make that kind of bring it into the 21st century and uh, make it, you know, if someone drives by, they're going to definitely say, okay, that we can see the context of it, but it looks like, um, it definitely looks like something that is historic and, or excuse me, of uh, the 21st century. So ways that we did this again, the brick patterning, kind of a little bit more modern um, doors and windows. We put a date stone, so that's a very obvious kind of marker to the age of it and components like that. Our final rendering is one that kind of shows what it would appear in the winter. Um, people were very conscious that they wanted it to look good all year round, which is very understandable. So as you know, the leaves and the foliage go away and it things kind of start to look dead, we didn't want it to you know, stand out and kind of contrast with the area. So this really shows how it um, it really blends nicely. I think this color in particular with um, both summer and the winter aspects of it here on this north side, you can see the stone wall that we placed um, to kind of mask the electrical gear behind there for the people that live further up the street. Um, so yeah, those are the designs that we have come up with. Again, really taking into account kind of all the, the factors being the public, you know, our clients with Salt Lake uh, City Public Utilities, where, you know, have a lot of constrictions being in a historic zone, and then just the fact that, you know, we really need to modernize this pump house for, for future to use. So um, with that, I will turn it back over to Laura to kind of wrap things up here. So thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, so is what's next um, and I apologize that my audio didn't come through um, loudly um, in the, the last presentation um, the Zach are you still sharing the PowerPoint presentation um, I it looks like it switched over to you now that okay no. <laughs> take it away all right, all right we're seeing it Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, so the next um, the next step for Salt Lake City Public Utilities is that we need to submit a packet to Salt Lake City Planning and the Historic Landmark Commission. Um, we are shooting for um, submitting that packet in April and planning a Historic Landmark Commission hearing in May. Um, we also hope to give the City Council a briefing during the spring and summer of this year. Um, we're looking at potential procurement of the equipment for the well house this spring and summer 2020 and construction in the fall and winter of 2020 and 2021. Um, one important note about doing this project is because this well is so critical during the peak demand season, primarily during the summertime. The only time we have to do this project is in the fall and winter when we can turn the well off. Um, we don't have those high water demands to meet. And so, so that we're limited in, in terms of the timing um, of the construction of that project. And, and I, of course, we have we have time for questions. So if there are questions that um, folks would like to raise right now or any feedback or input, uh, we'd be happy to hear them. I did see one question come through 
um, a question it was why do we um, disinfect the water from the well and the reason for that is to make sure that we have residual disinfection within the distribution system um, we're required by um, the state division of drinking water to ensure that we have residual disinfection so that we don't have um, bacteria or other things growing within the um, within the distribution system. All right, so um, any questions? Uh, another question that we saw that uh, that came up um, was the uh, what is the service area for this drinking water well? And the service area, the area that receives this water is primarily most of downtown Salt Lake City. Um, it also provides fire, fire protection, so increased pressure within the distribution system um, within that part of the service area. Um, but it's also important to note that public utilities manages all of its water resources in a conjunctive manner. And so, while we could bring water into downtown Salt Lake City from other sources, that water is actually spread across a much larger 115 mile service area. So the, the drinking water well provides a lot of resiliency to our city in addition to that fire protection. So I saw another, this is Jesse Stewart uh, talking. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I saw another question that came in, will trees need to be removed to accommodate the proposed well building? And yes, um, if you remember the, the last image that Zach showed, or maybe one of the ones that shows it kind of from the Southwest, uh, and the initial image I showed in, in the slideshow of the existing um, location, there are two trees right very close to the existing wellhead itself. Those two trees will come out. There's one large plane tree. We're going to do our best to save that. That's that's scheduled to stay. And then uh, some of the shrubbery there around the transformers will also be impacted. And we've got a, a landscaping plan will be coming along um, as part of the final package as we go forward. Then I get another question that says, are there feasible alternatives? But I'm not sure what what that means. Feasible alternatives to trees or feasible alternatives to the building. I'm not sure what that, whoever wrote that one, I, if you could have a little more clarity, I'd appreciate it. Oh, to the building, okay, are there feasible alternatives to the building? And I think uh, with what Zach showed is we've we presented, had the architects come through with the, the building footprint that our, that we and the design engineers, the, the uh, water engineers have designed to house the critical infrastructure. Um, we've got the, the six renderings that we first had uh, back on March 16th. And now we've um, had the architects, uh, Zach and John, move one of those, 3A, forward uh, with this. And that's, it may not be the final one, but it's one we, we brought one forward to show this community. In the stakeholder group. I saw another question about uh, noise issues, and I, I wonder, John, if you could address that question. Um, we have a number of slides on that issue as well. If you need to bring those up again. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> noise, I wouldn't say it's not going to be an issue. It's something that we're, you know, we're taking up in the design process. Um, like I said, the well's gonna be, the, the pump itself is about 82 decibels um, on average across all the different frequencies of sound. Um, so we're doing what we can um, using mass walls and using acoustical doors and windows um, to reduce it down as much as we can. We, we, at least in the planning phases, think we can get it down to, you know, in the, 30 to 40 decibel range at, at the exterior of the building. So, which is pretty quiet. Um, you know, it's like quieter than your average conversation. It's quieter than the neighborhood usually is. Um, and I should say that, um, you know, acoustics is kind of an inexact science, especially in the design phase. Um, we can put it down on paper as much as we want, but, um, you know, we'll be there 
every step of the way through design um, and construction and then close out to make sure that what we designed is actually getting it implemented. And, um, you know, there might be a few tweaks that have to be made um, once the, the pump comes online and we can actually hear it and, um, address those. Uh, looks like there was a question also from Facebook about whether the um, existing utility boxes will still be on the property once the well house is built. Uh, Jesse, do you want to handle that question? Oh, there, not muted. Yeah, so uh, the uh, with the new design, it's going to be new electrical transform. It's really all new equipment going in out there. Uh, well, like I said, the well house itself, the well and pump and motor will be inside the well house, electrical components. There will be some electrical components uh, behind the stone wall that, that Zach and John mentioned. And then it will be a new electrical transformer out there also. So really all of the infrastructure that's currently on site will be taken out, uh, including there's a little gooseneck over on the west where we, uh, that's when we turn the well on, but we're not ready to use it in our system that goes into the storm drain. That too will be taken out. So it's gonna be a, all the infrastructure out there will be removed and replaced with new infrastructure. We have a, um, we it have looks like we, Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I was just saying there were a couple questions to below, I just, or above that we might've skipped. I just wanna make sure that we get to those too. So I think there was a question about if there's other well houses in the, the area that are in historic districts. I don't know if Laura, you can help with that. Um, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any other well house in a historic district. Um, we do have a pump house up, um, which is, is not a well, but it's actually a pump house to get water up to a reservoir. And that one is up near um, behind the Capitol. Um, um, but that's the only one that I'm aware of in a historic district. There's the one in Liberty Park too. I don't know what that is, but is that a? I think that's a pump house as well. And that's a, that's for parks department for uh, their irrigation system. And the well and the uh, pump house that Laura is referring to is a booster station. It it actually takes finished water within our system, just pushes it higher up to a higher zone, where it can then gravity feed back to consumers. Yeah, just scrolling down the the list of questions. Another question: Would chemicals be stored aside from? Chlorine, and I, I think it's important to note that we're not storing chlorine on site. It's um, the calcium hypochlorite tablet, and um, there wouldn't be any other chemicals stored on site. Is that correct, Jesse? We're not using yeah. anything else in the treatment process. So the, the calcium hypochlorite is going to be. They come in pucks. They're kind of the size of a hockey puck, and what the way that works is it goes into a system where water. We take some water from the well. It goes across those and takes that into solution. And then that solution is then fed into the culinary system. So it'd be very minimal, um, basically five gallon buckets of um, calcium hypochlorite tablets stored on site. And we'll, be, we'll bring those in as needed to uh, make sure we've got enough there in the hopper to, uh, to, to disinfect the well. Thanks, Jesse. That leads into the, the next question. Uh, what will the daily or, or weekly activity level at the proposed facility be? And will it be disruptive at all to the neighborhood in terms of traffic and, and et cetera? And maybe you could explain the current activity at the well and whether or not that would change. So the, the well itself is used as a peaking well. It's not used year round. Although if we have need, we, will, we can use that year round or any time. Uh, when the well's on, we have daily visits to the site. We have operators come there daily to inspect and uh, make sure everything's running appropriately. Uh, that's typically just a, a pickup truck or a service truck that comes up, parks on the street, and operators go inside. Uh, for bigger types of work, uh, we, if we're ever going to pull the pump, uh, we'll be bringing a crane in. You'll remember about a year ago we did that. We did a full evaluation of the well. We pulled the well, uh, scrubbed it, bailed it, and assessed it to see what condition it's in. That's where we got the relining. We're going to reline that as part of the new, the new uh, construction project. But really, it's going to be daily activity. Uh, we'll be bringing the, the generator that we're going to purchase. We'll drag that in, trailer that in periodically to test switch gear. And during emergencies, that would be there. And then it would be for more robust maintenance that we'd have um, bigger rigs in there, such as cranes to pull equipment. 
I see a, a process question as well. Um, will there be more input that can happen on the design or, or is this what we are moving forward on? Um, so we are asking for more input in this meeting and we do need to submit our application to, to planning and the Historic Landmarks Commission um, pretty soon. So we'd like to, to see any, any additional input um, from you uh, now. And then we will also be, there will also be a public hearing with respect to the Historic Landmarks Commission for additional input. And there's a question about other public engagement. Um, the next presentation that we'll make as a design team will be to the Historic Landmark Commission, and that's a public meeting that solicits um, public comment as well. So that's an opportunity. Looks like um, Salt Lake City Planning will also be taking public comments during the review period as well. Did we miss any questions on here? Um, can we get a copy of the slide from this presentation? Yes, we can We can make this presentation available. Uh, we can post it on our website and make it available in other ways as well. Happy to, to pass it along to folks. All right, I'm not seeing additional questions right now. Um, asking the, the team who's monitoring the Facebook feed um, if they're seeing anything. It looks like there was a question if a landscape plan is coming and yeah, that is, that will be uh, coming shortly. And the landscape that we're showing in the renderings is based off the draft plan that we have, but that'll be a part of um, the landscape plan will be a part of the HLC packet that we submit um, later this week. Uh, there's a question about whether the building will be secured. Uh, Jesse, would you like to address that question? Yeah, so the, the building itself will have two entrances to it, actually three, there'll be a, a rooftop hatch that will be locked that will be used if we're going to pull the pump. So a crane would come in and access through the roof. Uh, there's the south double doors, which go into the main equipment room. Those will, won't be accessed often. Those will be for uh, larger maintenance projects. Uh, those will be locked and, and, and secure doors. And then there'll be one other door on the, um, the west side towards the north. And that'll be just a, a, a person entry door. And that'll also be a secure door. So it'll have just secure doors um, to secure the building itself. There's one about who can we talk to in order to rescind the modern elements. Um, your best your best route there is probably to come to the HLC meeting um, that we present this at and give your give your thoughts to the historic landmarks commission. They're the one who they're the ones who wrote the guidelines that we are trying to follow as closely as we can, which includes um, you know including contemporary design elements. So probably be the proper forum. We have another question. Will COVID-19 safety measures change anything about your project or do you know at this point? Um, I guess the question is with respect to meetings and construction, that type of thing. Um, the COVID-19 safety measures won't change anything about the design of the project. Um, but I think this question is right on point in that, you know, as, as we're having this virtual public open house here, we're going to need to see how the Historic Landmarks Commission um, will hold their public hearing. And, and um, if we still are under these restrictions, it may need to be a virtual hearing as well. Um, so that's something we'll follow up with um, as we get closer to that. Um, but there's another question about um, what is the ventilation um, in the building for? Um, Jesse, do, or one of our architects, would you like to address that? Yeah, I, I can take that. Um, 
Any building that's occupied needs to meet code requirements for ventilation so that people who are in the building can, you know, they're breathing fresh air and, um, you know, if you're working in the building for an extended amount of time, that's, that's very important. Um, and I should note that some of the heating um, and air conditioning of the building is actually being done by the well water itself. It'll be in a um, heat recovery loop that will be inside of an air handling unit. So that was one kind of innovative solution that our mechanical engineer had for um, penetrating the exterior walls as, as little as possible and also not having a, an exterior condenser unit. We have another question. How can you be sure your funding for the project is secure in this present global crisis? That's, that's a great question. Um, we have public utilities and, and the city on the whole has been looking at um, the potential economic impact to municipal functions. Um, we have actually um, revised our fiscal year 21 budget, our proposed budget that will um, be uh, reviewed by our Public Utilities Advisory Committee this week. Um, and this is a high priority project. So this is one of those projects that we will prioritize um, to get completed because of the criticality of this well. Um, and we, we think the funding should be there for that project, but of course, this is something that we'll continue to monitor. Hey, this is Jesse again. I'm gonna, I've just been rereading through all the questions because they they came in pretty fast there for a minute. And I wanna go back and make sure that we're addressing everything. So one of the questions that came up was, how will the community be impacted during construction? Uh, once, we, once we're getting towards that phase and well ahead of that, we'll be going out with a, uh, a construction plan for any road closures and where we're gonna be staging that. That's a lot gonna come from our, whoever we contract to do the construction. They will be helping with a plan to make sure that things are minimally impacted for the residents. So that will be forthcoming. Um, one of the questions was, how does this well help with fire protection? And again, I, uh, to go back to the amount of water this produces during peak demand. So it produces both volume and pressure within our system. And as Laura mentioned, it's a conjunctive system with all of our water sources. And by adding this as both a source and a, and a, uh, a source of pressure, uh, we're able to maintain uh, fire suppression throughout the city and throughout its distribution area. Um, some other questions were, are there options for future engagement? Uh, we'll be posting these these slides online and we encourage people to continue to write questions to us on that. Uh, but as, as Laura mentioned, some of the next engagement uh, will be um, the HLC as we get toward, as we get moving towards that. And um, another question, I think we've addressed this, but I'll go back to it. Uh, regarding the external boxes. Again, those will be removed during construction and new electrical will be brought in. I'm on mute. No, I'm not. Um, another question came in. Why hasn't River Rock been included in the options? Um, stone wainscoting. Um, I can answer that, Laura, if you want. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, tried to bring in the, the river stone uh, in a couple different iterations. If you see in that, and we can refer back to that later on, but the final renderings, we do have that stone river rock uh, used as the fence that uh, on the north side. Um, the feedback we did, we had some iterations that had a little bit more use of that. And uh, generally it seemed that the immediate residents that they weren't too uh, keen on that. It seemed kind of too busy for them. A lot of that, or in a lot of the, instances just because of uh, the location where it's sitting, there's already a lot of existing river river rock used. And so they just didn't want to get too heavy on that. Um, the stone and Wayne's coating. So um, Wayne's coating, we haven't explored too much, but some of the other, we have kind of used some other residential um, uh, products, you know, or, or designs within the, the, the earlier ones. And generally people kind of were more keen towards the brick and that kind of continued to to come up, and so ultimately, our our final designs are kind of taking into account what we've we've heard the most. So you know, that answers that. So I I do want to just clarify. Um, I think there was a question earlier about uh, whether there will be additional. Uh, 
um, areas where people could comment on this and also whether we would post the slide deck. And we will be posting the slide deck on Salt Lake City Department of Public Utilities website. Uh, we have a landing spot on that website specific to this project called the Fourth Avenue Well Project. Um, and there are ways for you to comment to us directly to public utilities. And as mentioned earlier, there will be a review period where public comment is received from the Salt Lake City Planning Department um, and then also at the Historic Landmarks Commission. And there's another question that just popped up. Um, what are we doing with the Fifth South Well? Um, and actually, that that is not a drinking water well. It is a um, pump pump station. Is that correct, Jesse? So there is a there is a fifth is south a, well right next. Fifth, oh, fifth south or fifth fifth avenue? I guess maybe we could clarify that question. Yeah. And then it says fifth east. East. Oh, the artesian well. Oh, okay. Um, so the artesian well um, on 800 South is um, currently being rehabilitated by, I believe it's the um, Parks Division. Um, that's not a well that is in Salt Lake City's drinking water system, but it is a well that people do, do use to um, take water um, and um, when we also do test the water quality of that and provide that information publicly as well. And that, that well, also the artesian well, will be rehabilitated as part of their project. So that will be back in action once they're done with their project. I'd have to, I'd have to follow up with Parks Division to see where they are on that. Okay, looks like we don't have any more questions right now. Um, and this, uh, this feed actually will be available on Facebook. It's been recorded. Um, and again, we've provided a lot of different ways for all of you to provide us in input and feedback on the project. And we do really appreciate you participating in this virtual open house with us today. Um, thank you very much. Hey, I have one one thing left to say real quick. Um, I just want to thank the stakeholders who've been working with us for the last couple of years. Thanks for your patience and your input. And also thanks to uh, the council and council member Wharton for his input as we've moved along also. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Jesse.